great if you know we use these initial sessions to really listen and really focus on what each of our uh, presenters have brought and uh, really apply it to practical situations or to the situations that we heard from the first focus group um, we had with token engineers. <clears throat> and uh, at the end, uh, or if in follow-up working session, uh, if needed, or asynchronously, that we help uh, to synthesize or to adapt it in such a way that it becomes really practical um, in, in our context. Sounds good. So, perfect. Then, um, and then also, of course, uh, those sessions where we then have prepared that, uh, um, yeah, I, I also looked at that uh, with, we have more uh, advanced announcement or maybe even really set schedule when we want to present those back to the focus groups and back to um, bigger groups, right? So just, uh, and with that, Manu, if you want to present already, we can get started. Sure. Um, if someone can do me the favor of opening the link I sent on the Omega, channel and sharing that on their screen mm -hmm. on it okay thank you um one second sharing my window and you should be able to see the presentation now yes yes okay Okay, well, um, to start, yes, today uh, I'm going to be talking about the capability approach by MRDSN. And uh, very briefly, the capability approach is a normative framework, so it's qualitative in nature. Uh, and it deals with uh, human welfare and how to, it concentrates on on the capability of a person. Uh, how, do, how this person, how the capability of the person can achieve well-being um, rather than, than their mere right or freedom to do so, but the actualization of, of that opportunity. Um, and it was first uh, conceptualized as an alternative to the growth domestic product. Um, uh, statistic because um, well Sen saw that it wasn't quite um, it was just an aggregate of production but but it didn't take into account uh, the the flourishing of people within a country it could there were instances where the GDP might have been growing which meant the industrial sector uh, was growing, but uh, the the actual capabilities of people, uh, which maybe were deprived of education or or health, uh, so that the country could focus on other industrial concepts, was suffering. So uh, he he um, he developed this framework to as an alternative to to GDP. And, and yeah, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so some, some context. Um, Amar Jasen, um, Indian economist, he graduated with a BA in economics from uh, University of Calcutta, Calcutta in India, then another BA in economics from Cambridge. Um, his contributions range from welfare economics, social choice theory, economic and social justice, development economics, and measures of well being of countries, um, among other things. Um, and also, he had considerable influence in formulating the Human Development Report, which started mm -hmm. in 1990, uh, and, and that is an annual publication by the United Nations Development Program. And he actually launched the report in 1990 with the help of a Pakistani economist by the name of Mahbub Ulhaq. And mm -hmm. when he 
when he was offered the Pride Fellowship at, at Trinity College in Cambridge, he was well. He implied that he, he he would have four years of freedom to study anything he liked, and he made the radical decision to study philosophy, uh, explaining that that some of his main interests in economics relate quite closely to to philosophy. For example, social choice theory and uh, mathematical logic, which also draws on more of philosophy, and also on the study of inequality and deprivation. So we can see the, the capability approach as, as being rigorous in terms of uh, especially this iteration, which I found, which, which has uh, equations, and, and uh, it is, it, it, it's a way to quantify it. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, it, it's very normative in nature, and, and it has a lot of uh, philosophical underpinnings uh, behind it. So he, he's cool. still alive. He's he's currently teaching at, at Harvard. He actually um, he actually retired and then came back. He's the only professor in Harvard to have done so. I think they they asked him to come back. So um, <laughs> yeah, very cool. Uh, okay, so yeah, the when we speak of inequality, we're saying. Uh, that there is an, uh, a lack of equality of what, right? It's it's a concept that it's it's uh, it's very widespread nowadays. Uh, rise of inequality, but but inequality of what, right? Uh, inequality of resources, sure. Uh, utilities, mostly, yeah. But percent, the tentative answer w was not resources or utilities, but basic capabil capabilities that should be the focus of our study, and so. Sen argues that welfare ought to be measured uh, against the concrete capabilities of individual people rather than by an aggregate value, like I mentioned, uh, such as the GDP of a nation. And one of the reasons that, that top-down development, uh, one of the reasons for this is because top-down development is always going to trump human rights uh, in favor of, of uh, profit. Uh, as long as the mm -hmm. definition of terms remains out. Uh, so things are allowed to operate implicitly when they are not defined or when they are very vaguely defined. And so Sen tried to to correct this by creating a framework that would uh, enlighten or illuminate on on the actual, on what it would mean for someone to to nourish, to, to flourish uh, as a person. And, and so the concept of freedom here is related to real potentialities, what he calls the capability, quote unquote, uh, for what an individuals can actually do or be by using the resources. These two, these are the two things that are important. What the individual can actually do is the first one, and what the individual can actually be or become after he has been able to do something. Uh, and so the overall framework is, is related to the reasons why they value those potentialities as well. So it's it's objective and subjective in that sense. Um, so one of, one of the key concepts of the capability approach is the notion of substantive freedom, meaning the freedom to be able to achieve important things in life. And here okay. the term uh, substantive is used to con contrast, uh, contrast the notion of negative freedom, which we understand as liberty. Uh, so it's not just about freedom from interference, and it's not about freedom from the state, right? It's it's not about civil and political liberties alone, but it's about the freedom to be able to participate in society and to pursue your own goals. And and this has something to be described as, as flourishing. And, and as such, it is also the rejection of the economic model of individuals acting to maximize their self-interest, regardless of relationships and emotions, uh, which is what I mean here with uh, homo economicus versus homo florere. Florere is just not for flourishing. Uh, and it's an interesting distinction that, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's something that we take for granted as, as we're always acting to maximize our self-interest, but, but not really. We, we, there's a lot of other variables that we take into account, and sometimes we sacrifice our self-interest in order to preserve our relationships and to augment our emotions. And so for, for Sand, development is a process of expanding freedoms equally for all people. 
and it has its focus on human ends and the importance of respecting the people's ability to pursue and to realize the goal that they value. So in other words, their agency. And so mm -hmm. um, a capability is what you're enabled to do uh, or choose and to be or achieve given uh, your own characteristics, the people around you, the resources and services that you can draw on, uh, the rights that you can access, and the institutions, the structures, and legal frameworks of society. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. and, and so why uh, ought we be looking at the capability approach? Uh, well, for one, it, it integrates equality and human rights concerns. And in here, the, the FRIDA principles, uh, FRIDA are, it's, it's an acronym that corresponds to fairness, respect, equality, dignity, and autonomy. Uh, it, it also takes into account variations in need. For example, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it's gonna differ uh, between uh, a disabled person and someone who has all, the, all, all their uh, functions uh, intact. And, and also uh, it, it values both objective and subjective outcomes. It, it, it takes into account uh, the tools that you have at your, at your disposal. It can be, you know, a hospital, uh, a school, uh, public, public transportation, but also how, how um, playing or socializing with someone makes you feel. Uh, um, and, and if you're able to, to, to do that, if, if you have the means and the instruments to, to achieve that subjective outcome which you value. And, and so it reflects equality of outcome, autonomy and process through this. And, um, and yeah, uh, next slide. So this is one type of equality measurement framework, um, taking a look at inequality by seven characteristics, by gender, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, age, religion or belief, and social class. Um, the inequality of substantive freedom, meaning the inequality in the central and uh, valuable things in life that people can do and be. And um, the, the three aspects are uh, in terms of outcomes, process, and autonomy. And I'm going to go over these more in an example uh, later on. So if, if this is very abstract, it, 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 there's, there's a point where I ground this into an example. Uh, and, and 10 domains, uh, life, physical security, health, education, standard of living, productive and valid activities, participation, influence and voice, individual, family and social life, identity, expression and self-respect, and legal security. So all these things are incredibly valuable, but the, the, the um, ruling um, or the dominating um paradigm of our of our era is economic and so these things mm -hmm. uh there are not a lot of frameworks that that value these or 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 that take this into account so uh we take a look at how much people makes and what's like the uh minimum rate per hour that someone can can gain but as as things become more constrained for example right now with with the with the quarantines and such, uh, these things, uh, life and, and health and uh, uh, participation, influence and voice, social life, expression, these things are, are uh, not being protected in the way that, for example, other things uh, like, uh, other things like our, our uh, revenue or things like that are more easily quantified or more widespread are, are, are um, you know, protected or, or preserved by people. So it's important that, 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 these, that these things be taken into account, especially right now. Uh, yeah, so at, for the practical meaning of the concept of capability, right? Uh, and this is where it gets uh, more quantitative, right? Like, what does the concept of capability mean in practice, right? So 
a person's capability is, is a set of available functioning vectors. Okay, so what is a functioning vector, right? A functioning vector is, is just a combination of plural, uh, of several functionings measured at different magnitudes of achieved levels, right? That, that's, that's a mouthful. But for example, let, let's say, let, let's say uh, we want to observe writing and moving, right? So you may have been doing four hours of writing and one hour of moving. Uh, that's four comma one, if you put it to a coordinate, before the pandemic, when you had to drive to work and do the commute. But now maybe you're doing home office, right? So you may be doing five hours of writing and zero hours of moving. <laughs> uh, so five comma zero. And, and so, uh, again, this is for us, but uh, you can see how these can be also applied to someone who uh, lives in a community that's, that's rural, very far away from a school, and who mm -hmm. has to walk several hours to actually start writing on their school, right? So maybe mm -hmm. someone has uh, two hours of writing and, and four hours of, 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 um, of walking. And then when actual public transportation gets implemented into a community, then all of a sudden that person can do four hours of writing and one hour of moving because now there's a bus that can pick that person up and take, take that person to school. So mm -hmm. that's how we start seeing how the, the functioning vector or, or a person's capability as a set of available functioning vectors is uh, modified by the instruments that they're able to use, right? So a, a functioning vector is achievable when A, uh, its realization is not prevented by, by interference by others. Uh, that's the concept of negative, negative freedom that I, uh, that I mentioned before. And B, uh, the external and internal conditions and means necessary to realize it have been positively provided. So when both of these notions have been fulfilled, then the capability of someone at a certain point in time is the set of the various functioning vectors achievable for an individual by changing the way that person chooses uh, to allocate the resources and the utilization ability that that person has at that particular time. So, um, the, the, the set of functioning vectors, to, to put it in plain terms, it represents the real freedom of a person in terms of the opportunity that that person has to achieve functionings, which correspond to doings and beings, right? The, the, the two things I mentioned, to do, um, which implies to choose something and to be, which, which uh, leads to achieve something. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the set of functioning vectors represents the real freedom as the opportunity to achieve functionings realized by the, the two means of resources and the utilization abilities. So, yeah, uh, here we can see, you know, um, an example, right? So, um, again, we said that a functioning vector, combination of several functionings measure at different magnitudes of achieved levels. Uh, so we can, we can, Look right now at uh, the same example, writing and, and, and moving. Uh, so like I said, someone spending long hours commuting to work, uh, achieve or achieve six units of both writing and moving. Uh, however, let's say after that individual suffered um, a severe spine injury, then the figures became 10 for write and one for move. Um, and and uh, later they changed for they changed to seven for riding and two for moving after special transportation service, say an ambulance became available. And so in this example, we can see the the six comma six point. Um, actually, on the on the next one, on the next slide, uh, or the previous one. Yeah, those two in here we can see the the six comma six. Uh, which is the achieved functioning vector and the evaluation fun the evaluation function of a person, and also the, the capability set uh, on the left, and then on the right we can see how the the evaluation the evaluation function changed because that person uh, became injured, and so did the capability set. Uh, and then if we it, and, and again this this might seem. Uh, Again, the, these coordinates, it's just, we input numbers on one side and then we output on the other. So 
Uh, it's just a practical way. I, I don't want you guys to be discouraged uh, by by operations, but uh, I mean, we we are a very engineering intensive community, and if we want to apply this to the frameworks and the things that we're doing, I mean, we have to deal with these types of graphs and equations, and and so yeah, inputting the hours that that the the doings and the beings take, uh, and 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 actually graphing them is helps visualize the relationship that they have and how they can be modified by by different uh, sets of circumstances. So mm -hmm. yeah, the next next slide. This is uh, yeah. So this is the the yeah. This is the the one when where seven comma two. Uh, when when you introduce you know special transportation service um, and if you mm -hmm. next slide yeah so this is uh, a, a fractal um, structure of an individual's capability right so it might seem convoluted but it, it really it really helps us re-examine the relationship between choice and opportunity again going into the the philosophy of it right so mm -hmm. so the the, the relation between choice and opportunity is such that an individual's capability, and let's say for the sake of clarity, your individual capability in, in the main space of functionings, your individual capability is produced by transforming commodities with your utilization ability, while your utilization ability is produced by transforming sub-functioning vectors with your production function while your subfunctioning vectors are produced by transforming commodities by your general basic skills and so on. So this is just the way, uh, this is the way in which uh, it, it, uh, it makes it easier to put these things into equations. And mm -hmm. why are these equations? Because we, we're talking about uh, having, putting, putting our, our doings and the doings and the freedom that we have, uh, Putting that into a system of equations so that we can we can uh, use uh, an optimization problem to say okay how can we maximize the freedom that we have it would be okay how can we maximize the doings and the beings that we can achieve given a, a, a set of constraints and by doing that effectively we can start uh, framing in a way that's more quantitative and less qualitative we can start framing our demands uh, to, to, Hey, we need transportation service. We need health services. We need education. Uh, we need paid roads. We need, uh, basic, uh, food supplies. These type of things, they can be graphed into a system of, of, uh, equations and, and then optimized. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I just thought it was, it was, uh, it, it just, it was very exciting for me to to go from the philosophy more into the economic and and the the putting it into an equation. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so um, to in some the the level of an individual's capability is is really constrained by by their total resources and skills, as usual in the understood in economic models. Uh, but instead of just looking at, at a commodity function or a utility function, we're actually looking at capabilities now. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're actually mm -hmm. creating a function for the capabilities that we have, right? And, and also by contrasting both of them, we can see how there are various intermediate factors between the capabilities we have and the constraints mm -hmm. that, that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, next slide. Well, one question, oh, yeah. just a very yeah. short one. Yeah. So that definitely resonates, um, but also it uh, resonated with something that I just had in my hand, the, from reductionism to creativity. A and when I look at this, it's, uh, you know, resources and um, skills or, or will even, like my personal, but how about, have you come across whether he is also going into the environment and, you know, just the two people meeting and the environment in which they meet can change these parameters or, or this model significantly? Something uh, like that? I, yeah, I, I know that, I know that um, like a network 
can be um I know that a network and the relationships that exist between the different people, which are kind of like nodes within the network, I know that it can be uh, symbolized by by in linear algebra by matrices. And and uh -huh. being, that, being that said, I know that you can take a look at oh, okay, so there's there's different people within the network, and and how can we get from this person who has uh, maybe this mm -hmm. skill to this other mm -hmm. person, maybe they're separated by four or five degrees of people that, that they directly don't know, but indirectly. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. I know that it's, it's viable. Uh, I just uh, haven't um, been in, 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 from what I read uh, with Sam explicitly uh, that he has mentioned that. But I mean, it's, it's very... One of the, the pros, and, and if we go to, to the next slide, um, mm -hmm. the, these are the, the current applications and, and the next slide. Uh, the, there are, one of the pros is that there's, uh, um, it's, it's very well grounded theoretically. Uh, and maybe one of the cons would be that it's informationally demanding. Um, <laughs> so I guess to answer your question, the, there, there's a lot of resources Again, because it won the the Nobel Prize in Economics, so there was a lot of subsequent research done um, mm -hmm. about how this can be applied, and it has been adopted by a lot of uh, dependencies, um, uh, like gov governmental entities. So I'm sure there's a way to frame what you're what you're saying so that it can be applied to us. But I mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like I I haven't come across it. Okay, okay, that's super cool. Yeah. Um, and and so, yeah, to, to summarize so that we can go more into the discussion part, which is actually the, the, the exciting part. So to summarize the, the capability approach, why does it present a, a novel idea and some analytical tools for us to measure the, the value of freedom and to evaluate its distribution? I mean, that's, for me, that's amazing. Uh, and this new approach captures what is good for people in terms of capability and freedom. And by doing so, it makes it possible to introduce ethical perspectives into economics again. Uh, and to, to quantify this model, I very, very briefly went over the use of equations. And not even, I just graphed, you know, some very simple points. But if you go into the book that I used to prepare this presentation, it goes into Lagrangian functions. Which serve to like to like optimize and basically determine the, the maximum and the minimum of an equation, which in practical terms can be okay. What is the maximum amount of freedom that we can get given our capabilities and given the doings and the beings and the functionings that we value, right? Um, but I love it, goes, it. <laughs> it, goes, it goes very deep into like the actual math of it, and I didn't want to uh, uh, bore you or or you know make you turn off if you start seeing you know very complex equations but but basically what it does is it derives functioning vectors from commodity vectors converted mm -hmm. by, by individual utilization abilities and these two then expand uh the opportunity sets of community commodity vectors and individuals utility functions and from these we can obtain equations where individuals maximize their evaluation functions and with their opportunity sets of functioning vectors, in other words, their capabilities. Um, so given the skills you have and given the communities that you can access, there's a way for you to uh, to find a way to optimize your your evaluation function, which is kind of like the, the things that you're seeking, the, 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 the doings and the beings that you're trying to reach at. And, and so mm -hmm. it, 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 it helps, you know, individuals become sort of super rational. <laughs> Uh, who, who by by quantifying some of their preferences, they can choose optimal uh, commodity vectors uh, in order to maximize their 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 uh, their their functioning, their evaluation functions. Um, constrained by by sure the conditions of the market and private ownership, commodity prices, mm -hmm. individual incomes, and utilization functions. So. Uh, yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. The Super the next nice. slide is just it's just uh, 
how can we discuss? And I don't know if anyone has any questions. Probably several. <laughs> uh, can you, um, would you like to um, ask a few questions? One second. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, yeah. While I you're talking, I did a little research and uploaded some graphics that might. Uh, <laughs> nice. Have, uh, in the chat? Enhanced uh, the, you know, some of the understandings about that. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. I will also go, go deeper into, into this. There were several things that resonated, definitely. Oh, nice. Um, it. No, it is perfect because uh, the one thing that we are struggling with is uh, we, we are very well aware that there are um, qualitative uh, values and normative uh, things that actually influence our decision making, but we cannot or we assume we cannot capture them or we assume any model is going to be very reductionist. So let's just not capture it at all. But that's, you know, it's similar like uh, no governance is not good governance, right? So uh, similar to that, uh, I do believe that um, any form of quantification or, or modeling uh, also of qualitative um, values at the very least helps us not to forget them, even if we at the end come up and say um, that wasn't you know, sufficient. However, if you, uh, thanks a lot, Mani, bring uh, you know, a very well um, versed Nobel Prize winning uh, model, certainly, and again, because it uh, really resonated a lot from what we have been trying to do in token engineering, for example, in invisible economy, uh, where we need or want to actually have contribution metrics, but without measuring uh, only quanti easily quantifiable things, but also how people um, act, give, and how they feel when they uh, act. So that resonated a lot. Um, and then you say, do and be become have you come across in the works also about motivation? Like, um, I mean, he has he has such a he has so many books <laughs> that when you ask him what I can come about, I don't want to. I mean, he has probably written at some point. He has yeah, come, yeah. He has captured like all the angles because he has. I think seven or eight books, and then okay. also one of the books, uh, Martha Nussbaum, is also a very um, uh, a, a very important uh, researcher that I think Amartya Sen co-wrote, co-authored a book with her, and she also has mm -hmm. some books of her own. So I'm sure all of these uh, things about about justice, about freedom about about even motivation and and the the um yeah the the functionings uh behind it i'm sure at some point they have they have written about it uh it, it's just it's just a matter of like finding it and and mm -hmm. uh, applying it to our context what i really want to bring to our attention is the fact that we're doing token engineering for our social economic class <laughs> and and this is like we're taking we're taking the framework of this is for 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 uh, the development sector, so for people at the mm -hmm. bottom of the pyramid, for people very marginalized, and we're trying to apply it. We're doing the inverse, right? We're taking a framework that was applied for people who uh, have very little means to help themselves, um, mm -hmm. and we're trying to see, okay, this framework was. Uh, developed for them. How can we uh, use the extensive amount of, of literature on the subject and apply it to us? And at the same time, do not forget that the token engineering that we're doing, uh, we're doing for our specific, you know, middle to middle high or high, mm -hmm. high socioeconomic class. And how can we start 
uh, building things for uh, the the for for the 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 least uh, uh, lucky among us. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if the time yeah. is now or if the time is later, uh, when no. when more when more digital infrastructure has been created, I don't think the time is ever later uh, because I think things are uh, quickly uh, regressing, <laughs> and and so yeah. um, I think there's a huge. Um, there, there's a huge pool of 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 uh, labor and and uh, just culture and and just human dignity and and willingness to to um, to flourish from from people who who have not had the opportunity that we've had and and. Uh, at the very least, we can we can leverage it, and at the very most, mm-hmm. we can you know sacrifice a little bit to to help them. So, yeah. Share back. Yeah. The the one thing that resonated a lot is when you said, um, you know, the this functioning vectors are improved or modified by instruments, and basically, when we think about uh, Uh, coming back to, let's say, our luxury uh, problems of coordination um, in these digital infrastructure that we're we're building. And I do believe that we will see definite improvements or modifications when we, for example, automate uh, many things or in token engineering commons, for example, when we combine source cred and praise or when the Discord boards uh, bots are basically helping in in uh, you know helping with recurring tasks and reminders and so on. Um, at the very least, uh, that reminded me of you know um, the token engine or token economies or communities that want to adopt token um, uh, or create their token economy that this type of thinking might also help them to see, okay, um, you know, what is what are our functions and vectors on that level and what uh, tooling that is uh, implemented, deployed, um, can help us to improve. So that might be something when we look deeper into uh, that might be very useful, something like a capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a readiness yes. or, or you know just giving them also um and with them i mean really uh, groups uh that are coming new to this domain uh-huh. of token economies yeah i thought basically mentioning mm-hmm. it to them, uh but uh I, i wanted to first you know discuss it here in omega see see where it comes from it uh i think They, they, they have their, uh, the way, the way I, I thought about it was, okay, maybe for like V2, for, for right now, they have their own, um, way of, 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 uh, structuring this. And mm-hmm. later on, if, if these gains traction here in Omega, uh, we can start, you know, because I definitely, I, I need some other minds to, to start tinkering yeah. on this. Uh, definitely yeah. not. Not just, I mean, I very good at finding ideas, but I, I need the help of other people to actually develop them into something meaningful. Um, so yeah. I wanted to first bring it here because it's, it's normative, it's qualitative, it brings uh, ethics into the mix, and so it's it's precisely the the within the uh, mandate of Omega. Mm-hmm. Later on, we can we can give it to other working groups. The, the one working group that we can also, as soon as that's more um, contextualized, mm-hmm. the token engineering uh, tech labs uh, with Sean and the others, uh, you know, we've been looking into how we can combine. And I can imagine that they also uh, pick this up, especially because Sean um, and others from Longtail Uh, fintech are also very much into projects and supporting projects that aren't just uh, crypto native 
but actually, you know, working with um, uh, communities that aren't uh, digital native even, right? Uh, but with native <laughs> communities and on uh, many different things. So I could imagine that uh, it might help. Um, first of all, Tech Lab might would possibly be uh, interested in uh, the modeling aspect of it all. And secondly, if uh, we could pull this off, then that might be really an, an, a very useful model that people can plug in into their uh, system model. Um, also thinking about Dada and their social sensor or Ikigai. <laughs> Um, so a couple of, um, I just made some notes, like practicality of it, where we can further develop it and where we could um, test it, apply it in token economies that are open and in need uh, and interested. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So. How about others? Yeah, thanks for cluing me into this. I'm going to have to spend some time looking at it, but I really appreciate the, uh, the heads up. I'm a collector of mental models, so <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, our super collector of mental models, and he's he then synthesizes, merges, and dispenses them, them uh, then when when and where needed, contextualized. <laughs> So, so super cool. Yeah, I have, it, it, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, like, yeah, it would be super cool if you know it could get developed in this working group, and then if you know if it's uh, getting good, like applying on other working groups, and yeah, I think it, it, you know putting ethics into the mix, like especially you know in the reward system. Uh, mm -hmm. No, it's just something very delicate, like where I feel like ethics are very important. And yeah, if we somehow f test it and see it works, like I would love to see it implemented around TC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I think I think maybe one of the reasons why we um, hold programmers in such high esteem is they're they're they're, they're very smart people, they're very competent, but uh, in the context of, of what I explained is that they, they increase our, our functioning vector, right? They, yeah, yeah. They, they, they create the tools that allow us to optimize the functionings mm -hmm. and the, the beings that we can. And, and so they, they create these tools that, that make us more, <laughs> Than, than what we were before they created them. And and mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think it's, again, it, it can get really mathy, but when you just understand that it's, it's very practical. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Super cool. And, and this one fractal structure, um, Again, that also resonated a lot, I understand, from individuals. Um, I'm really inclined, uh, and I would love to, you know, go further and then figure out if I find something. Um, like, where it, I, I it's almost like book. potential. I can share the book and some, some notes on the book, mm -hmm. like what each mm -hmm. chapter is about. And mainly the ones that deal, uh, I think the first three chapters deal with uh, more of the theory part and uh, sort of like a preparation. And then chapter four is actually the economic modeling of, of the individual capability. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very recent book. It, it, I think it launched earlier this year. And uh, and oh, yeah, it, that's all right. Cool. Yeah, the, the the book is titled the the ethics and economics of the capability approach. So nice. the actual 
Okay. The actual economic formulation or like turning it into a system of equations and using matrices, mm -hmm. factors, and inner algebra to actually quantify mm -hmm. it, that's very recent. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I was extremely excited when I saw it because, um, I mean, even, <laughs> even when I didn't know what it meant, I knew that I knew the, the, um, uh, I've, I've, I've studied since then and I understood that for it to be applied, it needed to be sort of like universalized into a system of equations and mm -hmm. that can be into code and then that can be graphed. And that can be, uh, yeah, shown and 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 uh, turned into something that that can be adapted to to different contexts. So, um, yeah, I wanted to to bring it here, and I'm, I'm glad you guys like it. And I'll, I'll keep I'll keep developing it, and I'll bring it to to the other working groups to see uh, to see how we can implement. It. Very nice. But one question I do have. And this is this disabled or yeah valued activities. Those again are um, you know um, defined um, in a society, for example. What is a valued activity, or uh, what is a disabled person? And again, something that is coming up for me very recently is this whole. Uh, you know, neurotypical uh, and and neuro uh, diverse uh, people, and basically also the understanding that uh, it's you know from years and years or decades earlier it has been looked at as um, yeah um, di disabling because you cannot participate uh, in social norms and so on and so forth. But uh, more and more, uh, and especially also maybe with our society that just functions differently, that all of a sudden these different thinking people bring very different values and functionings to the society. And, uh, you know, there is this interchange. And that's something I would also like to question or look into or find ways to open this up a little bit. But did you find uh, something or somewhere like wh what it really means, you know, uh, in relation? Is it as I think that it's in relation to what society thinks, what is, you know, functioning? Um, it, it's I, personal. Uh, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do it. Well, there's a really <clears throat> interesting thing about that. So have you ever heard of a, a gentleman who used to go by the name of the Wizard of Clapham Common? No. no. Henry Cavendish, one of the most influential. Um, he basically invented chemistry as we know it now. <laughs> and he, he almost certainly... Um, <clears throat> Uh, redefine the scientific method into the method that we use now. Um, and he did all of that while being profoundly on the autism spectrum. He's one of the primary people. If you want to read about neurodiversity and the contributions of people in society about that, there's a great book called uh, Neurotrot. And um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful book. And in it, he's included as one of these... Um, uh, people where you just super obviously and very famously uh, autistic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like there was this famous story where he, well, he first of all he was born into a famous uh, British sort of uh, uh, like royalty or whatever. You know, they have a whole mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. and they just give those people a lot of money or whatever. And so, <clears throat> in the 1800s, he. Um, his dad, you know, got him interested in science and he inherited, you know, the family estate and he literally turned it into this Clapham Common area, turned it into like a mad scientist lab. Like, and, and one time he ran in, there was some very upstairs, downstairs kind of thing. Like if you've ever seen like Downton Abbey or whatever, it's very much, you know, the way that that works. And so <clears throat> anyway, he once ran into one of his uh, servants uh, on one of the 
on one of the stairwells and he had his entire house um, redesigned so that that would never happen again. <laughs> so like this guy, he just lived in a building by himself and had enough money and servants to like support his thing. And basically like made chemistry. He's, he was, he was basically the, the bridge between the old phlogiston era and modern mm-hmm. chemistry. <laughs> and, and wow. they discovered uh, that he, as a you know neurodiverse person, basically, um, yeah, he discovered way more things than they realized. Um, same thing with uh, Nikola Tesla, for example. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, so you yeah. know, there's a bunch of bunch of people like that, um, and I'm, I've made it something of a study of these people um, too. You know, there are other people, um, <clears throat> not only who have autism, but people who had spiritual awakenings or both. Um, so yeah, the neurotribes, the legacy mm-hmm. of autism and the future of neurodiversity is a really good start mm-hmm. and might, might mm-hmm. point you in a direction of how to value, um, people like that. Uh, one thing I mm-hmm. wanted to bring up from what I heard earlier was, um, that, uh, um, somebody was talking about how, um, was this something that... Oh, I've lost it now. I'm sorry. I'll come back to it. No worries. Uh, 